Ignite your curiosity with Austin next. We're watching Austin transform from a thriving ecosystem into a global superstar. With our host, Jason Scharf, we aspire to better comprehend the true nature of innovation. Together, we will uncover what makes a successful ecosystem and navigate the technologies shaping our future. Now let's dive into what's next. Today's podcast is sponsored by Austin Private Wealth, a registered investment advisor focused on fee-only financial planning and investment management. Their mission is to serve affluent clients with personalized financial advice, fostering a trusted relationship that will endure for generations to come. Austin Private Wealth is not just about managing wealth. They're about inspiring you to embrace a future filled with possibilities and helping you architect enduring legacies. Their core values of integrity, service, caring, excellence, and growth are at the heart of everything they do. Connect with them today at austinprivatewealth.com. Austin Private Wealth is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Austin Private Wealth and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. No advice may be rendered by Austin Private Wealth unless a client service agreement is in place. Investing involves risk and possible loss of principal capital. Please seek advice from a licensed professional. Austin is adapting to and building the future in real time. I'm Michael Scharf. We are exploring and driving our transformation into the next innovation powerhouse. I'm Jason Scharf. I'm a bio-researcher at UT to the assembly line worker at Tesla, from the musician on 6th Street to the coder at Dell. And with the founders, funders, and early employees of the next great startup, we are all Austin Next. John Sibley Butler holds the J. Marion West Chair for Constructive Capitalism at the Bacones Graduate School of Business here at UT Austin. His focus is on both management and sociology. He's also the Sam Barshop Fellow at the IC Squared Institute, an organization dedicated to the creation of new ventures throughout the world. In addition to his tenure at UT Austin, Professor Butler is also a visiting professor at Aoyama Gaokin University in Tokyo and the University of Southern Maine. He has served as a consultant for the United States military, State Farm Insurance, and many others. He was also part of the economic advisory team for Governor George Bush's successful 2000 presidential campaign. Professor Butler received his undergraduate education from Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge and his PhD from my alma mater, Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Finally, John has appeared on over 30 radio and television programs, now including the Austin Next podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Go Cats. <laughs> How are you doing today? Doing quite well. Good. Good to be here. And welcome to Austin. Thanks a lot, John. We're really happy to have you. Well, let's try to get into it. We've seen a tremendous amount of growth in Austin over the past several years. And that growth has been built, obviously, on a strong foundation. And it's that history we want to talk about today. A history that's shaped by individuals leaving their mark, the institutions or companies that scale ideas into growth, and those moments of inflection when something truly has changed. To you, what are the most important people, institutions, and events that paved the way in Austin? Well, you know, I think it, when, you, when you look at it, um, I can tell you this. Austin is the development of one man the way we have today, and that is George Kosmeski, the founder of Teledyne. He came here to be dean uh, some years before I got here. And I can just remember in 1978, I got here in 1974, seemed like it was yesterday, called everybody together and he said, you know, my kids won't have anywhere to work. We were losing our best and brightest to Boston and to, and to uh, developing uh, Silicon Valley and indeed to Houston and to Dallas. And, and Austin was a, uh, what a playground, always a very, very gorgeous city of hills and lakes. But the great opportunities could be found, we can say, in government and the University of Texas. Now, State Farm had moved here, and IBM was developing here. So without a doubt, it was George Kosbeski who, who drew out Austin. And we started to think about different models of how it should be done. So, of course, what we wanted to do was to say that, look, if we look at the great centers that's developing, and Silicon Valley was re really created by 128 in Boston. Uh, that is, uh, doing business in Boston and being creative in Boston, you had to belong to the right families, belong to the right clubs, 
etc. So Stanford opened up his arms and said, you know, why don't we come here and let's talk about the relationship between science and technology. So George started the, the IC Square Institute uh, to really, really bring people from across the campus. And this was a huge inflection moment for Austin and the University of Texas. Great enterprises start with science. They do not start with management, accounting, or finance. It starts with science. If you look at Carl, Moore, Carl Moore's book, Birth of the Multinational, 2000 BC, then we began to see relationships. Remember, we were all professors, so everything we did, we also documented. But the big thing came when the IC Square was created. And then from IC Square came our laboratory, which was the Austin Technology Laboratory. It also meant moving the university away from just being the university to relationship between academia or science, and government and industry. And then we looked around and remember, here's the stalling statistics. Since 1970, 98.9% of all the great companies in America that scale have come out of three places. For well, Silicon Valley, the mother of all mothers have done it all, from Hewlett Packard to Hotmail to eBay to Google to you name it. Austin, we've done well with Dell computers. They do not start with management, accounting, or finance. It starts with science. If you look at Carl, Moore, Carl Moore's book, Birth of the Multinational, 2000 BC, then we began to see relationships. Remember, we were all professors, so everything we did, we also documented. But the big thing came when the IC Square was created, and then from IC Square came our laboratory, which was the Austin Technology laboratory. It also meant moving the university away from just being the university to relationship between academia or science, government, and industry. And then we looked around and remember, here's the stalling statistics. Since 1970, 98.9% .9 of all the great companies in America that scale have come out of three places. Well, Silicon Valley, the mother of all mothers have done it all, from Hewlett Packard to Hotmail to eBay to Google to you name it. Austin, we've done well with Dell computers, evolutionary technologies, uh, uh, Glowfish, John did uh, Whole Foods, John Mackey did Whole Foods, and of course, uh, National Instruments with Jim Trussard, and just boundless other companies that were acquired. So what we're doing then is, is looking at a model. It's a model that puts science and technology first, and then you have to have the investors the thing about those companies that started in these areas, I mean, uh, Micah was 19, uh, Gates was 20. Uh, you know, they were, uh, they were all very, very young students. So all of these companies that scale, that are expressed with Smith, he was very, very young. There was a relationship between uh, the changing science and making science and technology at the very, very front of how you think about enterprise. So from my point of view, Microsoft is a computer science company. Uber is a computer science company. When you put science and technology first, then you ask other kinds of questions. So we always had, a city always had this, right? Okay, we're going to pay a company to come here, give them some tax breaks, and let them, and let them create some jobs. That's one leg of the stool. The other leg of the stool is, okay, we're going to help scale you. But the startup leg is what America doesn't get. And so we started with a, with a certain kind of vision uh, that came from George, the founder of Teledyne, who also was a, he was from University of Washington, but did a lot of stuff in California. And from that, the Austin Technology Incubator with, with Laura Kilcrease, 
and a bundle of, of professors from engineering, uh, Dale Tessa, uh, Bob Peterson uh, from, uh, from marketing. And uh, we started and it, it started running and then the, the cluster, you know, Michael Porter's cluster dynamics kicked in. And then of course the government uh, came from people like R.W. President Bush was was uh, was the governor, and actually the the city rid of quarterback Glenn West quarterbacked everything, and then Ann Richards came in when Ann Richards was here, and Austin became a center to think about how to create jobs and how to create wealth. So I think the first inflection point was was George bringing it together and then bringing together government and industry and science or, or academia. That was the first part. And then the next question was, you know, how do we really, really begin to fund these companies? So I want to dig a little bit. So when you guys first, when George first created IC Squared, um, how was it structured? What was, you know, where was the ideas coming from? You said, you know, obviously putting science first, but Kind of how did all of that come together in actual practical day to day? Well, if you think about a typical university, uh, we are lo we are we're in colleges, and then we're in disciplines. What IC Scale was designed to do was go across campus and to bring faculty members with great ideas together internally first. So George created endowments for those faculty. So we had faculty from pharmacy, from engineering from the natural sciences, from the liberal arts, and from the business school. So it was a juggling, juggling, if you will, or a reimagination of what the university should look like. So we would get the endowed professors together. And when I say endowed, it was, it was a name professor. I was a Sam Barshop. Sam was the person who created the uh, La Quinta Inns. And so that was the first structure. All of a sudden, you're meeting people from other areas. A business history, very, very important. And it was called the Institute for Constructive Capitalism at the time. So that was the first structure. And then, and then, and then what happened was that we decided that the best and brightest minds are always not just where we are, but somewhere else. So we, we created national IC Square Fellows, and we would have a meeting every year. And they were international fellows. They came from China, Japan, Germany, France, all over to create a synergy of innovation and to ask what we call unstructured problems. Unstructured problems were, were problems that really seemed to have no answer. But, but, but Pregogene, who had won the Nobel Prize, for example, and how it was utilized in that structure, won the Nobel Prize on self-organizing things in the universe. One of our first unstructured questions was, as we put Austin together, would things self-organize? Or would we have to organize it? So that's the first structure. The structure was reimagining the university, going across the disciplines, bringing science and business together. And remember that if you start with science, where would the science come from? Often like Silicon Valley, it was built on DOD technology. So therefore what we would do is to say, look, look, what's, what's, what's sitting on the shelf? And remember in the, mid, in the mid 1980s, the government stopped funding privately on innovation centers and created something called major research universities. So we were trying to get in get in on that act. Our governor Connolly had come through uh, years earlier, the, the governor Connolly of, of, of President Kennedy uh, assassination. He said, look, here's the deal. If the state does not get its university together, all the money is going to the East Coast, University of Chicago, Northwestern, and Stanford, or the West Coast. So that was a change that we had to respond to. And, and Texas and North Carolina are two of the few, quote, Southern 
universities, although I consider Texas not to be Southern since I'm from Louisiana. This is something else. This is, this, to me, this is more like, you know, the, the crap from Northern California. <laughs> you like that, huh? <laughs> but anyway, seriously, so, so, so what happens then, um, we had to bring in the science. And, and if you think about what we did, we said, okay, let's get the students, here's some science, and let's build a business model around that yeah. science. I want to go back and, and dig a little bit on one of the things you just said. When you talked about creating IC Squared and, and launching it, you, you talked about one of the questions that you had was whether or not this was going to be self-organizing or whether it was going to have to be organized. And I know in other parts of the country, that's been one of the huge questions in terms of how to duplicate this kind of innovation center. Yes, it has been. What, what we do, what, you know, it's a kind of, it comes from Perkins per Union's work. And what we decided was not only that we have to really organize it, but it did become self-organizing once the synergy got there here, here, here at the University of Texas uh, at Austin. But the other thing was the mechanism by which you need to create wealth. That is, we had to organize the wealth in Texas, which at that time was mostly oil and gas. Everybody was wondering, what, what is Kosmeski doing? What is Laura Kilcrease doing? The legislatures were saying, what are you school teachers doing trying to uh, create company? And then of course, as, as industry came, in, industries came on board, for example, the software industry was organized. So we organized uh, an element of software, which is now the technology. And, and, then, and then we had to organize as wealth was being created, Jamie Rhodes began to organize all of the wealth in, in, uh, in the state. So you have these institutional arrangements that must play an important role. Uh, for example, NASDAQ was organized to, to create wealth for the old cowboy kind of countries, uh, companies to separate it from uh, the regular stock exchange. So self-organizing, what we what we do is always a question. That's based on the the sociological concept that, of course, people are organized to try to solve a certain kind of problem. And so we started by organizing, but then, of course, a synergy developed. And I can say right now, and I do lectures all over the world. When I was director of IC Square, I took the model all over the world. I have a book with Dave Gibson on the Austin model called Global Issues in, in Technology Transfer, but you're absolutely right. You have to understand how these things really, really organize. Now, the thing about Austin is we were really, really planned. I think that Silicon Valley grew up haphazardly in an interesting kind of way. Uh, for example, uh, Silicon Valley, they do their stuff in engineering because the entrepreneurship is in engineering rather than an institute like uh, IC Square. And so I think that the organizing principle is very, very important for anything uh, that we do. And in this case, remember that we were so long organized around educating kids, getting kids a job, and that's still going on. But when you add the three-legged stool, and, and then, of course, you look at and you, you know you say, well, what's going on? And then Dell Computers did very, very well, which of course was our eminent uh, case study, if you will. And of course, when Micah, I think when Micah went public, he created in the Austin area 935 millionaires. That's like 30 million in the bank. So that was new for that was new for us. And one other thing I might mention is that. If you look at the history of American enterprise and, and how wealth is distributed, basically you had you had managed, you had investors, you had you had management and you had unions, and you had income. And of course the unions would meet with management uh, to make sure that they can have a, a piece of the pot and there of course a, a demonstration and riot. Well, we're not a we're not a union state here in, in Texas. And what we did was to replace that model with share prosperity. There was, a, there was a professor at Stanford that came up with something called stock options. And so 
can you imagine you know, what if you're working for a company and all of a sudden, like an Apple or Macintosh, you know, at the time, all of a sudden you have stock options that, that's not worth anything and you become successful. All of a sudden you have 50 million in the bank. Well, that's, that's replacing the tradition of unions with, uh, with shared prosperity. It's not a matter of saying that one is better than the other, although I'd rather have the, the 50 million, but it's a matter of organizational structure. And so the new model was, okay, if you start a company, build your workers into the company. If you look at what happened with, with uh, John uh, uh, Mackey and, uh, and Whole Foods, and we had a big flood of 81, and he had a little small store down at 12th and Twelfth and Lamar. The whole store was flooded, and all of all of his customers came in and and rebuilt the store. You know, yeah. and that's when I knew the whole whole food was a was a religious sect rather than just a, <laughs> <laughs> more than just a business. Yes, more than just yeah. yes. Let's talk about Dell for a couple seconds because. I've I've heard the story of the Delionaires, if you will, several times in the last few months. How did that impact the city of Austin? Well, it did two things. Uh, first of all, it was interesting because we had we had we had developed investors from oil and gas, and they're the difference between investors that's coming out of corporate America and investors who created their own firm. We had something called the Capital Network that George started. And these were people who had done well in oil and gas. Uh, the capital network were people who had started companies themselves. And what I, what, I, what I saw was that there's a big difference between you starting your own company and helping out and you coming out of corporate America and helping out. I think the corporate America, uh, people are coming from Wall Street and helping out. I really do not understand how to really start a company from A to B with, apps, with just the technology and nothing. So, it, but it, it, it really impacted us in a lot of ways. Uh, number one, all of the 501Cs for the Boys and Girls Club, the giving in Austin, Texas, uh, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, uh, the different, and I was doing with uh, Ben Barnes, we did the uh, Boys and Girls Club. Uh, so we did that, and they also organized. We had something here that that died called Austin 360, right? As people came in, so it gave the city uh, a big uplift and a wealth that we had never had before. Uh, I think I think when I got here, and you must have wealth to start companies and awesome profit proper. It was the people who owned the car dealerships that made up most of the wealth. And we had a, a mayor named uh, Roy Butler, no, no relationships, by the way, <laughs> uh, that was there also. So it, it gave a sense of, uh, of, uh, of wealth in the community, of support. People called upon uh, them to fund different kinds of things. And also, they really wanted to invest in, in startups. But as I said, it was different between them investing and the person who had started his own, uh, you know, all engaged rig. Uh, from zero, and I, and I think that's that's true today. I think the difference is that uh, the corporate guys think more of division, what you should do and what you should do. The startup guys, you do it all. But it had a tremendous uh, uh, impact on, um, on on the city and and the restaurants and the housing industry and those kind of things. We've talked a lot about, I think, you know, the oil and gas influencing then into the technology and then obviously the, the, you know, the Dell millionaires making that influence. One of the things that I found interesting recently is while we've been known for computers and semiconductors, today you'll find space companies, consumer tech, life science, CPG. How do you see that kind of diversification in sectors that we've kind of evolved from? Where's that kind of coming from? Well, yeah, you know what? I just talked to Laura Kilcrease uh, last week, and we talked about this. Laura Kilcrease is now uh, doing innovation in Canada. She was our first director of um, the Austin Technology Incubator. So let's talk about Austin 1.0. Okay. Austin 1.0 really did not have any, any wealth, and, and wealth was brought in from, from, uh, from the oil and gas. And you're exactly right. Austin 2.0 developed around software. Uh, and leading that charge was uh, Kay Hammer, our company, Evolutionary Technology. Kay Hammer was a professor of, uh, of uh, 
medieval uh, philosophy, you know, that all the philosophers profess, you know, coding is simply Aristotle's logic when you take a close look at it. And so we developed a software council, right? Then you had all of the fab. We definitely cut our teeth on, on software. The, the, the very, very first Austin uh, 3.0, one of the very, very first companies to go to the bio side was really the company that I first funded called Glowfish. Alan Blake, uh, former, um, uh, finished from UT Austin, former student at the Macomb School of Business. And, and, and Rich, they had this wild idea that um, we could take the data from the National Science Foundation and they were trying to create a fish that was pollutant, that was that was sensitive pollutants, you know, like the bats in the cave. And so Alan came here, right here in my office here, and and uh, and I did the first funding for something that was called Glowfish. And all of a sudden, I knew nothing about science and and genetics, although I have a sister who's a genetics geneticist. And all of a sudden, you know, we had we had a lot of interesting things happen when we launched the company. Uh, California, of course, being the People's Republic of California, as I refer to it sometimes, refused to sell them. Um, there was a there was a place in uh, in Canada. We had it in a store, and the Canadian said, "All right, wrap it up, put it in cellophane, make sure it doesn't interact with any other companies." But I say that because there was nobody in Austin to build a board around. The bio had not been here. There was no medical school here. And so we really worked hard. It was Austin and I, I mean, uh, Alan Blake and I, when we first started. And then I added Bill Cunningham, who was former chancellor of the, the UT system, former president of the University of Texas, and former dean of the business school, but more importantly, my one of my best friends. When we launched that company, uh, we were front page of the New York Times. 